Good morning. Well, or good evening if you're in Hong Kong. Um, my name is Jennifer Turner. I direct the China Environment Forum here, and I want to welcome you to the Woodrow Wilson Center and today's meeting, Hong Kong's Path to Carbon Neutrality. Now, I've been at the Wilson Center for 23 years, and I actually, I didn't tell the speakers this, and maybe some people in the audience probably don't know this either, but my very first big international meeting that I held, it was two days, it was in Hong Kong. It was at the Jockey Club right by the border of Shenzhen. I was partnering with the Hong Kong Journalism and Medium Center, Media Center, and it was about cross straits, environmental activism and green journalism, had about 65 people. My Chinese was better. I spoke Chinese the whole dang time. Um, it was really exciting sharing lessons of trends. And, and I, I was thinking before, you know, I was realizing as I was preparing this meeting that in some ways, Hong Kong is kind of environment stuff is in my project's DNA. Because over the years I've had, a lot of environmental activists coming in talking about green port initiatives in Hong Kong, both the government and the activists kind of really leading the region in terms of promoting reducing emissions at ports. I've had researchers um, talking about the, you know, cross, you know, Hong Kong Guangdong cooperation. And just want to say that lightning strikes twice at the China Environment Forum, because I have Secretary Wang here again for the second time. Um, he came and spoke for me, I think it was like four years ago. I know time and COVID, I kind of forget what the, what the year is. Um, and today he's, I've invited him here to come and talk about Hong Kong's carbon action plan for 2050. Now, the secretary is going to give us an overview about this big, you know, not only will they hit it by 2050, they have a super ambitious pledge to an interim pledge. And I'm not going to give away this, you know, I'm not going to steal his thunder because he's the lightning bolt here today in the meeting to tell us about what Hong Kong's going to do to decarbonize. Um, he's been the Secretary of Environment in Hong Kong since 2012. I think you're the longest serving person in that position, if I'm correct. And not surprisingly, over that time, he's launched a lot of environmental blueprints and action plans about air pollution, energy efficiency, biodiversity. And I think uh, your fingerprints are all over this climate action plan today that you're gonna introduce. Um, so, and, and he's an architect by profession, doing lots of, in the, starting in the 1990s, a lot of, lot of green building, green you know, sustainable um, infrastructure. So it's not gonna be a surprise that, you know, cause that's in his DNA that there's gonna be a lot of conversations about what's happening in the building sector. So after he gives his, his opening introduction, we have um, two speakers who are joining to kind of delve a little deeper. We're gonna have Daryl Chan, who's executive director of Hong Kong Monetary Authority. So of course, Daryl, your responsibility is that you're in charge of like promoting Hong Kong as an international financial center. But now on top of that already busy job, you're gonna be, you've been helping to push green finance and making Hong Kong a green financial hub. So we wanna hear a little bit about how you're doing that. Um, and then because electric vehicles and green transport is a big part of this, of this vision for Hong Kong, um, really happy that uh, Professor Becky Liu, who's the director of the Institute of Transport Studies at Hong Kong University. Okay, I shouldn't say this, my favorite university in Hong Kong. Um, she's gonna talk second and she's done a lot of research over the years, of course, you know, looking into electric vehicles, green transport and the ultimate low carbon form of transportation, walking communities. So she's gonna to talk to a little bit about some of the challenges and maybe, okay, pun, bumps in the road that could Hong Kong could be facing on green transport. But um, I think you guys will make it over, make it over those bumps. So I um, also wanna you know, acknowledge the audience who are tuning in today. We have a question widget underneath the, um, the stream. So you can submit your questions and at any time. And I also wanna thank the um, Hong Kong Economic Trade Office and the Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program for co-hosting today. So with too much of an intro, time to get to the fun stuff. Um, Secretary Wong, could you share your PowerPoint and we will get this, 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 this show on the road. I'm gonna mute myself and the floor is yours. Jennifer? Yep, Professor yeah, I can Lu. see your PowerPoint. Uh, I can hear your voice. It's all okay. you. Jennifer, uh, Professor Lu, Daryl, uh, everyone, welcome to the webinar today. I'm going to talk about Hong Kong's pathway to carbon neutrality. This picture shows that Hong Kong reached our peak emissions in 2014. At that time, Hong Kong people per person's annual greenhouse gas emission was more than six tons per year. But by now, it's down to some 
4.5 tons per day. And as mentioned briefly by Jennifer, we set a new mid-term target. That is to reduce Hong Kong's overall carbon emissions by half before 2035, using 2005 as the base year. And by that time, Hong Kong's per capita emissions would be about two to three tons per year. And we strive to become carbon neutral before 2050. Most of you should be aware that China updated its patch two years ago. The target is to reach the peak emission before 2030. That means less than a decade from now. And then which is carbon neutrality before 2060 is ambitious. It's ambitious between the peak and the carbon neutrality within 30 years. About Hong Kong, as mentioned earlier, two years ago, we made the pledge is to achieve carbon neutrality before 2050. And last year, we add a midterm target and we reached our peak emissions in 2014. This picture shows a typical landscape in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a mountainous, we don't have much land, but we try to maximize the renewable energy potential. So he, here you can see a pilot scheme on floating solar photovoltaic panel in Hong Kong's water body. So no, not, that means not only on land, but also we maximize the water bodies to provide more renewable energy, including solar energy. And you should be aware that Hong Kong is, is a tropical city. It's pretty hot. So if we provide the floating solar panels on water body, the cooling effect can optimize the performance of PV on average. The floating PV can provide 20% more renewable energy than the rooftop PV. Interesting. Last year, we launched and updated our climate action plan. So it's called Hong Kong's Climate Action Plan 2050. The graph show our pathway. We reached our peak in 2014, as mentioned earlier. We add a midterm target is to reduce Hong Kong's overall carbon emissions by 50% before 2035 using 2005 as the base year and carbon neutrality before 2050. I emphasize before is, is that we will review our climate action plan every five years. If there are opportunities, we may be able to reach carbon neutrality earlier than 2050 earlier than 2015. Looking back, in the last decade, Hong Kong has allocated around 6 billion US dollars on the decarbonization measures on renewable energy, energy saving, electric vehicles and vessels, and also waste to energy and waste to resources facilities. And it's not only about the government's investment, but also say in the private sector, for the two power companies in Hong Kong, they invested in their last and current development plans, spending about 10 years, about 5 billion US dollars on major decarbonization measures in relation to the power companies. This leaflet shows the Hong Kong's Climate Action Plan 2050. It highlights what we have done in the last decade on decarbonization and also climate adaptation and resilience. It also outlined what are the major challenges in Hong Kong? Hong Kong is a complex city, top, top, tropical city, et cetera. We also outline what are the new strategies to lead Hong Kong towards carbon neutrality, and what are the opportunities like green finance. And it also set out what are the four major decarbonization strategies in Hong Kong, that is net zero electricity generation, energy saving and green building, third, green transport, last but not least, waste reduction. Because in Hong Kong, as look at the footprints on this line, there are three major carbon emissions in Hong Kong. That is electricity generation, transport, and waste. And 90% of the electricity in Hong Kong are consumed in buildings. So that's why we have these four key strategies. And to support that transformation, 
I highlighted five aspects, investment, infrastructure, innovation, interaction, and integration. Let me elaborate. Firstly, about investment, as highlighted on the left hand, we set the first ever climate budget on behalf of the government on climate adaptation, resilience, and mitigation. For the next 15 to 20 years, our budget is equivalent to US dollar 31 billion on these measures. And since 2019, we initiated the Hong Kong government's wind bond program. And since 2020, we, the government worked with Hong Kong MA and other organizations to set up the green and sustainable finance cost agency steering group. That is to develop Hong Kong as a green finance hub in the region. And I trust Daryl will elaborate more on this aspect. Okay. About infrastructure, we need infrastructure to support Hong Kong's transformation on these four aspects, on net zero electricity generation in Hong Kong and also in the region. Second, low carbon green buildings for new energy transport infrastructure, including electric vehicles, charging infrastructure, and I trust Professor Liu will elaborate. And last but not least, on waste to energy and resources facilities. For innovation, we use the state of the art technology, and there are also technologies are emerging that we have to catch them. So on innovation, I take four examples here. We set up a green tech fund two years ago on decarbonization and green project in Hong Kong and the region. We are going to change all electricity meters in Hong Kong to become smart meter. We set a seven year span and it's midway. That means within forthcoming few years, all electricity meters in Hong Kong become smart and we can write on that to make Hong Kong a smart and green city. We are going to marketize the EV charging infrastructure in public and commercial car parks. And also on recycling, we are using smart recycling bins for plastic beverage bottles recycling and also on food waste recycling. Because in Hong Kong, most people are living in compact high rise buildings. So smart bins help to collect not only plastics, but also other recyclables, including food waste in Hong Kong. Interaction, okay, today is a good opportunity, but at the global, regional, local, and also within government, there are different means of interaction. For instance, Hong Kong is a steering committee member of the C40 cities. So that the other members are New York, Boston, uh, LA, Tokyo, London, etc. So we exchange through that platform. We also organized the annual Eco Expo Asia conference and trade show. So welcome people from the US and other places to write on that opportunities to have the technology exchange, etc. We are also working closely with other Greater Bay Area cities. And last but not least, we set up a new task force within the government. There are young colleagues from different departments and bureaus on the new decarbonization technologies. An example is green hydrogen. It's pretty new, emerging. So we'd like to learn from other places so that we can make Hong Kong ready for the emerging technologies. Integration, that's important. Last year, we launched four environmental blueprints on ways, on electric vehicles, on clean air, and on climate actions. We focus all these blueprints to support the carbon neutrality goal. That means, for instance, we reduce waste, at the same time to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. We support electric vehicles to improve the air quality, at the same time to help Hong Kong towards carbon neutral. I think the Yiri roadmap as example, that was launched in large March. So that's now the first anniversary of this Yiri roadmap. I coded five examples here. For instance, when we launched the Yiri roadmap last year, one out of every eight new registered private cars was EV. But after a year, 
one out of four, double. That is the highest ratio as far as we know in the entire Asia, and the few topmost ratio in the world among world-class cities. On the commercial vehicles, it's challenging because Hong Kong is a hilly city. Uh, it's very hot, so the vehicles have to use energy on space cooling, etc. So that's why we set up the new energy transport fund to accelerate the transformation of commercial vehicles, including buses. And according to our data, we doubled the expand, exp expenditure of the funding year by year. We are supporting the pirate charging infrastructure in Hong Kong. We set a target is before 2025, 150,000 charging points in the domestic sector in Hong Kong. We have policy to support new buildings to provide the EV infrastructure. And we also set up a new subsidy scheme to transform the existing residential buildings car park to be EV ready. And we are also supporting the public charging infrastructure. Target is again, 2025. Uh, uh, before that, we'd like to have 5,000 parking infrastructure uh, with the EV charging. The good news is that we would meet the target sometime end of this year or next year. That means three years ahead of the target set. And we also set up the green tech fund to support the emerging technology on hydrogen technology for vehicles and also EV battery technologies and recycling. The integration, as I mentioned earlier, is that we'd like to improve the livability and the environment of Hong Kong at the same time to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. Here is an example. In the last decade, the, both the roadside and general air quality in Hong Kong has been improving. The major air pollutants have been reduced by 40 to 60%. At the same time, we reduce per capita carbon emissions in Hong Kong. There are different challenges in Hong Kong. Cause of decarbonization, space constraint, technology breakthrough is in need, demand for tenant, participation for all. But there are also opportunities, green finance, green economy, technology and innovation. And Professor Lu, please train more people so that we can enhance our capacity. And last but not least, but not least is the carbon neutral community. Last year, we launched the new proposal, Northern Metropolis, that occupy about a quarter of Hong Kong's territory. It's in the northern part of the Hong Kong territory, next to Samjan. We'd like to make it a livable green area, towards carbon neutral. To end, thank you for joining this uh, webinar. We did more partners on carbon neutrality within Hong Kong. We launched a scheme called Carbon Neutrality Partnership, inviting large companies and corporations in Hong Kong to set their own carbon neutral plan. The response has been encouraging. The picture shows the leaders of those companies and corporations in Hong Kong showing their hand, supporting the carbon neutral goal. So I hope for this uh, webinar today, we can have more partners across the Pacific Ocean so that we can work together for a carbon neutral world tomorrow. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you so much. I have this uncontrollable urge to make a little zero with my hands now. Um, yeah, so you, thank you. That was that was great. And, uh, and there's a lot of detail there just to tell the audience. Um, uh, Secretary did say I could post this, we'll post the, that, um, that PowerPoint on our website so you could dig into it more. I know there's, and we'll put some links in, there's more details on the, on, on your website as well. So, but I wanna remind people, you can start submitting your questions now. Underneath the stream, there's a little box that says your name, title, submit question, boom. So I'm waiting for questions, but while we're doing that, we're not just gonna sit around twiddling our thumbs. Daryl, you can unmute your speaker and tell us a little bit about Green, he, I mean, your Secretary of Environment put a big load of work on your lap here. So um, tell us a bit about where, what Hong Kong is, your plans are, for green finance and you know some stories of actual besides planning actual progress well thank you and thank you for having me um 
I think as far as your good story to tell, then definitely funding shouldn't be a major issue. Um, and since we are now on green, I think these simple answers get more green back, right? Um, so, and, and on that front, um, you listened just now that, that the Secretary Wong, that he also mentioned the uh, Green Bond Program. So I, I think for the government, one of the major sources of funding more all these green projects will be the issues of green bond. And in fact, the government, the Hong Kong government, they actually is one of the global pioneers in having a very structured and, and multi-year green bond program, which is pretty credible. Um, it has a ceiling of up to 25 billion US dollar. And so far, we've helped the government to issue uh, a few tranches of the green bond. And a big chunk of it actually is US dollar denominated. Um, and when we did a roadshow and a subscription, it's overwhelmingly uh, 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 popular among the uh, institutional investors from the US. So we got multiple over subscription from US investors. Uh, so I, I think that that tells quite a lot that um, as far as you have good projects and then you have credibility then actually you don't need, really need to worry about uh, green funding. So that's, that's one thing. Um, I, I think green bond just part of our effort to promote green finance. So if I may just share a few uh, key areas that uh, we are working on um, for, for promoting uh, green finance in Hong Kong. One is now for, for HMA, for example, we are the banking regulator. So one thing that we do is actually use our regulatory handle. Um, so we help the bank or we ask banks that they have to properly manage um, climate risk. So they look at their loan book and then they do the assessment. And then on our part, we help them do their stress test. And then just imagine what if a certain scenario comes up and then how bad uh, the climate risk will hit them. Um, and then we ask them to set up their own strategy, put in place proper governance within the banks, and then uh, commit themselves to make public disclosure um, of how they manage the climate risk. So, so all these things, we do it uh, through our supervisory work. And on the flip side of it, it's not just a risk, but it's also, it also means opportunities. Because when banks, they look at their balance sheet, they need to um, uh, manage the risk. Then obviously, the thing, one thing they can do is divert more funding or loan to greener projects. Um, so to them, actually, that creates an opportunity as well. So we are hearing far more banks uh, providing green loans or sustainability loans um, to corporates. Um, and then they're actually helping many of the cops to transform themselves or what we call a transition. So look at the, the projects they have, um, their current operation, and then see whether there's any way to help them green their projects and operations. So that, again, prov uh, 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 provides a lot of uh, funding opportunities uh, for the banks. And it's not just the HKMA doing this because um, our, our securities regulators, our stock exchange, they are also putting in place rules uh, for uh, fund managers and listed companies to follow as well um, in terms of uh, disclosure and that sort of thing. And, and I think in terms of disclosure, we are also one of the pioneers in Asia. So uh, we have already committed that um, by 2025, Hong Kong, all the financial institution in Hong Kong would have to be compliant with the disclosure requirement of the uh, international body, which we, we call the uh, Task Force on Climate Related Disclosure, which is a body set up by the uh, G20 to look at uh, financial disclosure. So we asked all financial institutions in Hong Kong to be TCFD compliant by 2025. We are the first in Asia to do this. Um, so, so that's making use of our regulatory handle. And the second thing is we, we also uh, do our part as a market enabler because you really want to create or generate a sort of ecosystem uh, for the financial institutions to uh, properly manage their green, um, uh, their climate risk as well as to grasp the opportunities. Uh, some things that we're actually working on is help banks um, tackle the pain points that they identify. So in terms of pick point, for example, we're talking about standards, the lack of standards. So, so how are they going to measure how well they're doing or, or how do they measure the corporates? So um, we, we, but Hong Kong is a small jurisdiction. So we can't really come up with our own standards. Uh, and then many of the banks operating here are international banks. So which is why we actually look at um, some um, uh, widely adopted um, uh, uh, standards or what we call tax taxonomies uh, adopted by other jurisdiction. And then we commit ourselves to the highest standards and then we apply them to Hong Kong. So for example, the common ground taxonomy that has been agreed between um, Europe and China, we decided it's a good model. Then we'll just uh, apply it to Hong Kong and then plus 
some of the variants that is more jurisdiction specific to Hong Kong. So that's on the standard. And then people complain about what well, a lack of data. So we will work with the academia, we bring in the ob observatory, we also involve our uh, environment bureau to see what data is already out there. And then we can bring all the data and congregate them and then provide some analytical tools uh, for financial institution to do the analysis. Uh, and that actually helped quite a bit in um, their risk assessment and, 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 and uh, um, identification of solutions. Um, and then we also look at um, uh, talent. So one thing that Secretary Wong just mentioned, capacity building, because uh, this is a new um, uh, industry or sector. So we badly need more talent, and which is why we are working with the academia and then um, uh, man, many of the training institutions, how we actually help build talent pool in Hong Kong to do um, a green uh, finance. And of course, how to create the market is also an important aspect of it. Uh, for example, if you want to avoid greenwashing, then you got to bring in more independent reviewers, uh, re reputable green reviewers, so that they can help provide independent third party a review of the greenness of um, the uh, financial institutions or the corporates. So we have been providing um, uh, grants and subsidies for people to do that sort of um, uh, independent review um, uh, or, or what we call the green review. Um, so, and then last thing is basically, um, we at HKM are also an, uh, a manager of Hong Kong's official reserves. So as an investor, we are also uh, walking our talk. Um, so we incorporate responsible investing in our investment process as well as our investment projects. Uh, and then we accord priority to responsible investing. Um, so that, that's also uh, the other thing that we are doing. So um, I guess uh, it's pretty exciting um, um, uh, uh, area. And, and we do see that uh, Hong Kong being an IFC, what we are doing is not just to the benefit of Hong Kong. We try to make an impact. And we do think that we have the responsibility and ability to not just serve Hong Kong, but we also want to bring green finance to help China in the transition and also to the region. I, I guess I'll just stop here and then I'll be happy to take questions later on. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, because in the and I had one question that we'll follow up once once uh, Becky's done here that about the kinds of cooperation, because we know China has been talking a lot and taking action on green finance, and it seems like a, a great marriage, could be great little competition as well. So, all right, Becky, um, it's all yours. If you want to use, I think you had a little infographic you wanted to share. You can put it up if you want. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I think this is a really refreshing to hear directly from the secretary on the government's exciting plans. And I, I see actually the single most important opportunity here is that Hong Kong's electricity is getting cleaner and cleaner. So without this, the effort towards transport decarbonization with EVs uh, is doomed to fail. Uh, with this golden opportunity, uh, I think there are indeed many road bumps, as Jennifer has suggested. So let me highlight three here. First, I think is really the nature of transportation itself. Uh, though power generation still represents the major source of carbon emissions, uh, government negotiations with key stakeholders have been much more effective and efficient worldwide. Now, this is attributable not only to the remarkable technological advancement in renewable energy, but also the nature of the electricity sector with an oligopoly structure and heavy government regulation. Uh, in contrast, the transport sector is much more decentralized with decisions of vehicle ownership and usage resting with a much larger number of individuals and small and medium business enterprises. And they are primarily driven by market forces and individual preferences. This is particularly the case for road transport, though the railway, shipping, and aviation sectors are less decentralized and challenging from this perspective. Second, I think the EV infrastructure support, including hydrogen refueling stations, EV charging facilities, battery swaps, and recycling, uh, is inadequate now, and the spatial distribution is not optimal. Now, promoting EVs in Hong Kong and many cities, I think it's almost like this a classical problem that people talk about, that you want to get a 400 kilo ox across a bridge that can only take 200 kilo of weight. 
So yes, there are plans to have you know, more electric charging facilities and the electricity consumption of EVs is only expected to take up about 5% of the total electricity, even if we have a full EV fleet. Now, nonetheless, in reality, there is a very big mismatch with EV owners finding it difficult to charge their vehicles. So even at Hong Kong New Centennial Campus with all the environmental awards, I have to fight for the free charging parking spaces in a big car park. I'm sure that many EV owners like me in Hong Kong are facing such real issues. And our comparative study of the Greater Bay Area and the San Francisco Bay Area on electric mobility shows that there needs to be a charging density of about 94 stations per road kilometer if we are to have full electrification. Now, Hong Kong has more than 2,000 kilometers of road and more than 200,000 charging facilities, much higher than more than 5,000 that we are planning. Of course, we need to have you know, good integration of private and public charging facilities. Now, finally, I see the biggest challenge actually lies with the carbon emissions from fossil fuels vehicles on Hong Kong's road. Now, in 2020, like in Hong Kong, EVs has been selling like uh, hot cupcakes, so to speak, right? Three millions around, uh, around the world, but they comprise only less than 5% of the entire vehicle fleet. The same trends actually are noticeable uh, in Hong Kong. So here I may like to share, you know, just a bit an overview of our licensed vehicles in Hong Kong. So despite all the success of the EV growth, uh, we would see that still 95%, if not more, of our vehicles, especially motorcycles, private cars, light goods vehicles, and medium goods vehicles, they are still fossil fuel based. So they are being continually sold in Hong Kong up to 2035, and a car can easily be driven for 10 years. So I know we have pilot plans for hydrogen, electric buses, heavy vehicle buses, but upscaling uh, would be a major issue. So to, to round up, I think it's really important that we also have a comprehensive policy to reduce the mileage driven by fossil fuels vehicles. And here, the International Energy Agency has given 10 top tips, including reducing speed limit, to what we also chit chat working from home for three days a week. And our research has also shown that we need to have five transformations of our city from changing our urban form to make it more compact, walkable to changes in lifestyle. So here, I think under the leadership of the secretary, Hong Kong can do more uh, to overcome these flow pumps. So uh, these are my you know, general remarks and I uh, give this back to you, Jennifer. Okay, it sounds great. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, when you were talking about the lack of charging stations and things, I mean, that's, it's global, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I think that that's, it's, but it, I know, chicken and egg, I, I don't have another clever kind of, yeah, it's true, but, but I, and, but I mean, in the States, so like, even in my own small city outside of DC, um, I'm seeing, I'm seeing many more electric vehicles, but people, you know, they had their own private plug in at home. But that's not really as much an option in, in, in Hong Kong, right? It would have to be in the in the parking garages, as the secretary mentioned, right? Yeah, but I do think, you know, a lot of this is really in the nature of transportation itself. Hong Kong has been doing well. And in a sense, I mean, if we can retrofit, especially the on-street parking with electric charging facilities, that could be a lot of opportunities. It's just a lot of practical issues that... Uh, they I think Becky froze for a second. Hopefully, she, she, Wi-Fi comes back. Maybe, um, um, Secretary Wong. Maybe, would you have some? Uh, both, um, both Daryl and Becky made some comments about you know, you know, suggestions okay. and what have you. Maybe give us some comments. Maybe start with the transport, but it's up to you. And also encouraging. Um, I'm getting uh, starting to get some questions in. Encourage the audience to start to really start submitting their questions. Secretary Wong. Okay, uh, Daryl first. Okay, um, I think on green finance. Um, the government, uh, in particular, the uh, we call the FSTB, the Finance, Financial Services and Treasury Bureau, together with Environment Bureau, are working closely with 
Hong Kong MA and SFC together to develop Hong Kong's wind and sustainable finance to turn Hong Kong into a hub to serve, as mentioned by Daryl, not only Hong Kong, but also Greater Bay Area, China, and also the region. Because in order to combat climate change, we have to work together. And green finance is an important aspect to empower us to invest in infrastructure and other innovations to decarbonize. That's one uh, response that I would like to share with you. And also uh, we will work closely with Daryl and his team and, and the Trey uh, to develop Hong Kong's wind finance. And on the uh, wind transport, I agree with uh, Professor Lu that there are worse challenges in Hong Kong and other cities are facing similar challenges. But in Hong Kong, probably we are having a, our particular challenges, as I mentioned it in my slide show, right? Hong Kong is a compact city. So there are opportunities, it's workable, right? But we also lack space. For instance, in Hong Kong, some owners with private cars, some owners uh, having private cars do not have their parking space, right? They have to park somewhere or also to go for some rental parking space. So the EV charging would be another challenge for those owners. But I think we are working step by step. Let me elaborate. For instance, uh, about 10 years ago, we made an incentive scheme is for the, all the new developments, if they would en enable their car parking space to be EV ready, then we provide them with the four area incentive. And now we are getting the result because all those new buildings are already EV ready. When people move in, they just make an application to the power companies. I was told that within two to three days, the meters would be dead. So that car, the EV can be charged easily. And as mentioned by Jennifer before the webinar, we talk about the visual fit of existing buildings because many buildings in Hong Kong are built a decade ago. So they don't have the benefit to enjoy the incentive I mentioned earlier. So I think two years ago, we launched a subsidy scheme is to subsidize the existing domestic buildings to upgrade the existing car parks to become EV ready. The scheme has been very much welcomed by the people. Uh, so that's why in the budget this year, we expand the budget for that subsidy scheme. And with the top up funding, we are going to virtual fit and upgrade about 50% of all the eligible existing domestic buildings car park within a few years. And I think that is encouraging. 50% of the existing parking space in all eligible domestic buildings in town. But certainly we need more charging infrastructure. So we're working with, with the trade to marketize the public and commercial parking space and even turn some existing petrol stations become fast charging stations. I think in other places like in the States, you're doing something similar. Uh, but at this sort, I think we need to work with the academia and the trade so that we can make the EV infrastructure more ready for the transportation. And as mentioned by Professor Lu, we set a deadline. Before 2035, we would stop the new registration of pirate cars if they are not EV or equipment. And that target is subject to review every five years. So if the infrastructure would be ready, we can make 2035 to become say 2030, right? I stop here, Jennifer. Well, what about, I mean, so, I mean, one thing that, you know, I always was struck with when I went, you know, when from the very first time I went to Hong Kong back, like, you know, 20, well, God, when was that? 1988 was my first time there. Um, that, I mean, your public transport in Hong Kong is amazing with the subway, with the buses and the, the ferries. Um, what about, uh, in part of your, because you've mainly talked about the, 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 the electric vehicles, like personal vehicles. Anything that um, either Becky or the secretary want to tell me a little bit about some, some you know, like public transport decarbonization? 
and walkability. Okay. okay, let me start first and Professor Liu can supplement, right? Um, in Hong Kong, as you mentioned, that we are enjoying pretty good public transport, okay, with the subway that is serving a lot of people on a daily basis, and it use electricity mainly for the power uh, the, the train, right? So if we're going to decarbonize the electricity generation, then the mass transit railway company can easily go towards carbon neutrality. That's good. But we are still having buses, franchise buses, mini buses, taxi, and lorries. So our new energy transport fund and other schemes would take these, say, five years to try out different new energy vehicles so that we can consolidate our roadmap on commercial vehicles within a few years. And gentlemen, you should know that Hong Kong is well known of its double-decker buses. Because in Hong Kong, among the franchise buses, about 95% are double-decker. They are heavily patronized and they have to go uphill, downhill, and also uh, use space cooling during the hot summer, right? So it's really challenging. But the good news is that the first ever electric double-decker buses has been in time. Without the, the COVID-19, it should be just open, but we postpone it a bit, but it is already here. And on top of that, we think that electric double-decker buses is good, but may not be good enough. So that's why, according to our climate action plan, launched last year, we made another patch. It's within three years, we would like to see hydrogen double-decker buses in town as well, so that we can try out different technologies to see their development in Hong Kong's particular context. And our new energy transport fund also subsidizes different commercial vehicles, electric taxi, electric minibus, electric lorries, and during the COVID-19, there are more uh, takeaway food. So even the motorcycle, electric motorcycles, uh, for the, uh, the for takeaway companies would also uh, like to see the electrification, etc. So we're trying uh, out all of this. And Jennifer, you know that in Victoria Harbor, we have a famous Star Ferry, right? So we have subsidized each ferry company to try out a pure electric ferry in our harbor. So within two years, when you return to Hong Kong, you will see four of them traveling within Victoria Harbor. So we are trying out different transport means from road to the sea. Professor Lu. Yeah, thanks a lot, you know, Jennifer and the secretary. I think uh, as Jennifer has you have suggested, Hong Kong has been doing great in great green transport for a long time, in particular in transport we have this policy of using railway as the backbone that is really you know, running on electricity and also an off-road mode. Uh, but I think here in particular, when we are talking about you know, uh, transport decarbonization and you know, this climate action plan and so on, we're really talking about a reduction target. We hope to further reduce right, the major sources of transport carbon emissions. Now, obviously uh, buses would be a major, you know, also player in the area because uh, somehow when we're also looking at uh, the transport decarbonization, the policy of railway as the backbone only is also a bit risky. We also need to have, you know, make sure a viable bus sector, but the heavy bus, re, uh, you know, uh, sector, despite the fact that we have, you know, uh, hydrogen and fuel cell buses, uh, somehow when we are talking about using hydrogen in buses, is less energy efficient than battery electricity. And also here, if we are really talking about transforming, you know, the hydrogen from gas and so on, this will be gray hydrogen, not really, you know, uh, that would be potential about, you know, what the, the challenge of how can we get green hydrogen in Hong Kong in an economic way. Now, similarly, I just want to conclude by also saying like uh, the electric ferries and so on with all these pilot scheme, it seems that they are running, but they are not, not really financially viable. So somehow maybe at the end of the day, if uh, all these uh, transition is to be really successful in the long term, all the infrastructure and also the sustainable business model needs to to be there. And maybe, you know, Secretary Wong hasn't really touched on, so I really also quickly touch on, because Hong Kong is also a major civil aviation hub. 
and the electrification transport decarbonization you know, of our Hong Kong International Airport uh, has also been making a lot of initiative as well. So when all these you know, connection and integration are being taken place, uh, I hope that we will be able to make greater progress. Thank you. That's great. So let's kind of <clears throat> go off the road here, maybe switch to another sector in terms of decarbonization, but I, I want to get to get back to Daryl. Um, one thing that, that for the transport and some of the other um, issues that there's talk that the secretary has mentioned, like, you know, there's like the green transport fund that you have these different funds, but you, you'd also said that, you know, with the bonds, can you just tell us uh, some other anecdotes of examples, how the, the kind of the green finance that you're, that you're promoting is really kind of has, has really catalyzed companies to, to make the investment, this kind of public-private linkage there? Yeah, um, I guess just a few examples. Um, now, one thing that we notice in recent years is actually uh, the quick pickup in green loans, um, especially in the property development sector. So Secretary Wong just mentioned that, uh, well, green building is actually, um, because building consumes 90% of our electricity here in Hong Kong. So it makes every sense if you have more green building that helps a great deal in um, our, our uh, 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 carbon neutrality efforts. So um, what the banks have been doing with these developers is that um, they provide the uh, so-called sustainability linked loans to the developers. So if the developers build their buildings according to certain green standards, and then it's not just at the construction phase, but it also depends on the, out, the, the subsequent performance of um, the level of greenness of the buildings. And if they qualify a sustainability um, uh, standard, then um, the interest that the developers have, have to pay will actually become lower. So that actually provides a sort of incentives uh, for the developers um, to go greener uh, in return for lower interest charge. Um, so there's a, that's one example. And, and actually we're seeing that well, it started off with one or two major developers in Hong Kong, but then now basically many of, or almost every of these major developers uh, is adopting uh, green loans in, in their construction program. So that's one thing. Um, if I may just return to green bond to talk a bit about this, because um, well, Hong Kong, I, I think it plays a, a, a critical role in the regional green bond market. So in Asia, we are the number one spot in terms of uh, global issues of green bonds. Um, uh, and then many of these issues are not just Hong Kong based. They actually come from uh, um, other countries, um, mainland China in particular. So what we try to achieve is not just um, uh, sort of, um, well, helping them raise the fund. But in this process, because when you issue green bond in Hong Kong, you've got to have, um, you've got to follow internationally accepted uh, green bond principles. You've got to have independent reviewer to review um, the project, uh, your commitment. And it's just not at the point of issuance, but also subsequent years, they will have to go through this annual review of the actual performance. So what we do here is actually you make, you make use of this green bond platform to help people uh, 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 get the money or the funding for the green projects. But more importantly, it's also through the compliance that they ensure that the money is put to good use. It's not a green washing exercise. So I, I think these are the things that we try to do through green finance. It's not just about finance, it's more about green. That's great. No, thank you so much. But actually, Secretary Wong, we're on buildings now. This is your your DNA. It's like buildings. Um, now he was. We're talking about green finance for big infrastructure. But what about you know any kinds of policies or incentives to do some some of the low cost no low cost no cost changes to buildings that make them more efficient? I mean, everything from. I mean, it's not very sexy sounding, but like making sure your water heater is not too high. And I, cause we've seen in the States and I know in China as well, there's, a, there's been a lot of progress on these kind of lower hanging fruits or, or, as, or as Hong Kong already picked those. Can you tell us a little bit more about some other ways that buildings, uh, the, a question came in asking to talk a little bit more about the progress of green buildings in Hong Kong. So there's the finance stuff on the, that Daryl was talking about that's important for this infrastructure, for those charging stations. What else can you tell us, Secretary? Wong? Okay, Jennifer, a good question. As mentioned in uh, our climate action plan 2050, there are four key uh, strategies. And one of them is about the energy saving and green buildings. Similar to the space, we have the local green building certification. 
in the US, you have the need, and in Hong Kong, we have the BIM Plus, covering both new buildings and existing buildings. And Hong Kong Criminal Council is doing good, and they are promoting more developers to apply the green building certification for the existing buildings, right? And under our uh, company authority partnership scheme, as I mentioned earlier, they are going to set up their carbon neutrality plan for their companies and corporations. And green building certification for both new and existing buildings are one of the recommended criteria. But I would like to uh, take this opportunity to highlight a recent initiative under our bureau is we call the RCX Retail Commissioner. Retail Commissioning is an idea is that say for an old car or an old machine, okay, it's not up to the optimal efficiency. But if we understand its performance, we can tune it in a smart way. Then with minimal investment, we can handle its performance quickly. So we call this retro commissioning. We started that a few years ago and used some government building and also some commercial buildings to try out the methodology. The, the, the response has been encouraging. That means the payback period could be one or a few years and the performance could be in, improved, say, by 10%. And it's not only for Hong Kong. So we also signed a kind of uh, memorandum of cooperation with Winter Bay Area Cities and Shanghai a few years ago. That means it's not only to help Hong Kong building to save energy, but also working closely with other GBA cities and Shanghai to share the knowledge uh, across uh, different areas in China. So I think it's something that we are proud of and would like to uh, share with you the RCX initiative in recent years. Thank you, Jenna. No, that's exciting. I was glad because I was actually going to ask uh, if, if you or anyone could talk a little bit more about some of the cooperation with China on these issues. And also want to interject, I got someone just submitted a question about how, you know, Hong Kong is not producing their own electric vehicles or batteries. Um, I mean, where are you getting your electric vehicles and what do you do with the batteries when they're tossed out? About the vehicles or, or batteries? Both. Well, talk about the batteries. That's that's because that's a really hot topic here in the states okay. as well. Hong Kong people like uh, electric vehicles from the states. <laughs> and anyway, that according to our EV roadmap, uh, we have the um, incentive uh, to encourage the private sector, the, I mean the private car owners, uh, to uh, replace uh, their traditional uh, private cars to become EV. And as mentioned by uh, Professor Lu, that it's not only about the vehicle, but also we have to look into the issue holistically. For instance, the total number of private cars ownership in Hong Kong, right? So a few years ago, we introduced the one for one scheme. That means instead of encouraging new EV car owners, okay, we encourage the existing private car owners if they need to replace by a new one please go for an electric vehicle. That is the one for one scheme and they will enjoy better tax incentive. Out of all the new EV owners, 90%, more than 90% go for the one for one scheme. So that's one of the contribution by the Environment Bureau to help the transport department of the Bureau to control the growth of pirate cars in Hong Kong. And as mentioned earlier, the tax incentive has been pretty uh, positively received by the people. Uh, last, the, uh, a year ago, one out of eight new private cars newly registered was EV. Last year, doubled it, one out of four. These first few months in 2022, one out of three already. So every two new pirate cars in town, okay, almost one is EV. So, so that, that's pretty encouraging. But I would like to share that uh, Professor Lu is correct that there are various challenges ahead. EV charging infrastructure and also how to work on the commercial vehicles. So I think that there are challenges, challenges ahead, but I think there are also opportunities. So that's why we have to work together as partners to tackle that. 
Thank you. So Thank quick, you. quick poll. We know that Becky drives an electric vehicle. <laughs> yeah, and, and Jennifer, I, I, I also hope to answer the question, you know, in a more direct manner because I do see opportunities because EYD, actually China's, you know, the biggest uh, EV as well as battery manufacturer is just next door, you know, in Shenzhen and the Greater Bay Area. So even though, you know, the standards and so on, we still need to struggle a bit, there will be huge opportunities for Hong Kong government to work with the Greater Bay to see, you know, how we can offer more choices for, for people in with EVs. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, because you want to have a good market. Um, but, um, but, you know, but also when we talk about the waste of the batteries, it reminded me that because I've been doing a project on plastic waste in Asia for the last two years. And I know that you, you mentioned briefly that in your plan that, that um, waste to energy, you know, working on sorting waste. Um, what about further upstream in terms of like reducing, like particularly plastic consumption? Because plastic you know, there's, there's studies, you know, we had someone come talk about how that, you know, if the world doesn't rein in our single use plastics, we won't be able to meet our Paris climate commitments because I mean, shifting away, EVs get us off oil, but the oil and gas industries are, you know, they're, they're developing more in terms of plastics. Are the, I, I know that there was like a, there's been a drink without, drink without waste right. yeah. initiative in Hong Kong. Anything else that you might, you might be able to tell us about in terms of like turning off the tap of the, of the supply of plastics in Hong Kong? Yeah. Jennifer, you are asking a very good question that, as you mentioned in our current action plan, energy electricity supply, uh, energy saving, green transport, and waste reduction. These are the four major carbon sources in Hong Kong. Um, the point is, is that um, we are going to implement the so-called MSW charging in Hong Kong. Because in Hong Kong, when you, you were in Hong Kong, when you dispose of waste, it's free, right? But you know that in Asia, for instance, in Korea, the more you flow, the more you have to pay, right? So we just passed the law last year. And this year we talk about the implementation timing for the MSW charging. That will probably next year. So that law would be powerful. Because I think they agree that Hong Kong people are, are the cost conscious, right? If it's with certain charging, then people would reduce the buying or, or, or to be more cautious when they consume, right? So that would help people to reduce waste at source, including plastics, right? And then it would also encourage people to do recycling because if they go for recycling, that would be free, right? So that would be very powerful. At the same time, we are going to launch Hong Kong's uh, plastic reduction strategies within this year. Okay, that would address different uh, single-use plastics from beverage bottles to uh, plastic bags and others. For instance, Hong Kong is the first ever city in Asia. If you go shopping and if you take a plastic shopping bag, you have to pay 50 cents at least, right? That has been Hong Kong for more than a decade. In fact, according to our recent survey, about 90% of Hong Kong people are used to bring their reusable shopping bag to go shopping, but it's a pretty good culture. But we would like to even further strengthen that regulation because in Hong Kong's landfill, the, large, the largest amount of single-use plastics are plastic bag related. So we're going to reveal whether 50 cents would be good enough after a decade. So I hope Daryl, Becky will support that. We would review that regulations to reduce different types of single use plastics in Hong Kong. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, yeah, well, no, thank you so much. We're, we're starting to hit up against our, our, our time here, but yeah, I should let you know that when I was invited as a, I got invited as a VIP guest to Hong Kong. And when they asked me what I wanted to see, one of the, my first things was, I said, I want to see Hong Kong's landfill. And they thought I was a little strange, but I saw your, I've walked on your landfill and I can see you have no space. So I, I'm encouraged by what you just said. And I think it's important that when people, that you guys put waste as part of your decarbonization plan. Municipal solid waste charging, go, that's awesome. So we've actually, we've got one minute. Um, Daryl, you've been like the quiet one here the most. Any final comment you have to, to add, either on what waste? I, 
What I, I would want to say is actually a huge opportunity is out there. It's just for us to grasp. Um, now, when I was listening to Secretary Wong talking about many of these new initiatives, I was just trying to figure out, so to what extent the green finance angle can chip in. So when you talked about, well, how to change people's behavior or, or the citizen's behavior in, in actually helping or contributing to uh, 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 climate um, uh, management, and actually, because very soon we'll be helping the government to issue the retail green bond. So we want to get the general public involved um, so they can get some return, um, higher interest than their bank deposits. But then through that process, they can also help the government fund the green projects. So perhaps later on, we can think about something, how we can actually marry the two in terms of not just the, the, the retail green bond, but something linked to certain metrics or performance on our um, our climate action. So, well, I think it's just the sky is the limit for us to come up with solutions. Well, I do have to insert here that I just got right in the last second, Andrew Yi, from, who's the director of the Canada Hong Kong Trade Development Council. And he wants to know about, we'll have to connect you to guys offline. He wants to know about opportunities from all this decarbonization strategies. What are the opportunities for kind of U.S. and Canadian companies, and how can these companies plug into that? Do you have yeah, a quick so ten now, seconds. Eco Expo Asia event. Eco you know, Expo Asia event. We have that uh, trade show at Green Conference, so we would like to uh, connect uh, full DDC. You know, the Trade Development Council. They would like to work with the companies from Canada, States, and other places, so that Hong Kong and our region can benefit. Thank you, yep. gentlemen. That's great. All right. Well. I, I, and for, we've hit the time and I think I have to, you know, I want to want to thank you all for coming, you know, staying up late to uh, have this conversation and I'm going to be knocking at your doors again at some point, particularly interested in the plastic changes and um, yeah, you'll be seeing me again because remember, Hong Kong is part of my project's DNA. And I want to thank everyone else for tuning in today. Note that next week on the 13th, we have a meeting about nuclear, the, the dark horse of decarbonization in China, nuclear power. Tune in for that, and um, we'll see you all again soon. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.